اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمدللہ بار الخلائق الاجمعین باعث الانبیاء والمرسلین ثم الصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء حبیب قلوبنا وشفیع ذنوبنا ابی القاسم محمد اللہم صلی علی محمد و علی محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على اہل بیته الطیبین الطاہرین المعصومین المذلومین لا سيما ولي الله الحجة ابن الحسن صاحب الأمر والزمان اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الأولين والآخرين إلى قيام يوم الدين اما بعد قال رسول اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وآلہ وسلم لابنته فاطمہ علیہ السلام ان اللہ لیغذب لغذبک ویرضا لرضاک صدق النبی وآمنا به نور مجالسکم بذکر محمد وآل محمد I would like to begin first and foremost by thanking the Shabaab who have gathered here tonight to uphold the memory and the tragedy of Sayyidatin Nisa al Alameen. From the brothers and the sisters who have given up their Saturday nights to show their loyalty to Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen, to those poets, beginning from the youngest brother that we had reciting. And this attendance, attendance of these majalis by honorable people like yourselves, the youth, not only is this an exhibition of the tarbiyah saliha given to you by your parents. But it is a demonstration of your love and your wilaya for Ahlul Bayt. For indeed, your presence in these majalis have a great symbolism. Your attendance in this majlis symbolizes, is an attestation of your loyalty to Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen. Your presence over here denotes, had I been there on that day of Saqifah, I would have ensured that no harm would have come to the door of Fatima. Leave harm to Fatima. The door of Fatima. The door dust at the doorstep of Fatima would not have been touched. Fahaniyan lakum. Congratulations to you for being in this divine registrar that shall be reviewed by Sayyidatin Nisa al Alameen herself. And we pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that we may have tawfiq for so long as we are alive to uphold the dhikr of Sayyidatin Nisa al Alameen, all of this with a loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. The importance of this majalis, majalis Fatimiya, ya ahibai, is something that needs to be understood. And it is by understanding the Adamah of Sayyidatin Nisa al Alameen that we are able to understand the importance of gatherings and the importance of majalis such as these. 
And it all comes back down to understanding the purpose and the reason for our creation. For it becomes obligatory upon each and every one of us. Earlier in our life rather than later to ask ourselves, to ask ourselves this important question. Why were we, why were we created? Why was I created? Was I created on this earth to just have a good education and a good job and to own a great house and drive a boom car and enjoy my life from its materialistic perspective? Not that there is anything wrong with this done in moderation and through means that are halal. But is this the end of my life? For what reason was I created? Why is it that we have in our communities in this day and age, be them Shia, non-Shia, Muslim, non-Muslim, faith-based or non-faith-based, you find that we live in a world where people lack purpose. They didn't understand what is the purpose of their creation. And because we don't understand the purpose of our creation, the choices that we make in life are poor choices, if not disastrous. For it is a, of absolute importance that we ask ourselves, why were we created? And as important as this question is where do we go to seek the answer for such a question? The purpose of my existence. You turn back to the Quran and you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala outlines the purpose for our creation where he states Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Wa ma khalaqtu al-jinna wal-insa illa li'abudun I did not create the jinn or the mankind except that they should be in a state of worship. And the worship over here, ahibai, does not mean being restricted to prayers or a state of psalm with all due importance to salat and all due importance to psalm. The word ibadah is not restricted. These two aspects are aspects of ibadah, but not ibadah being restricted to it. <coughs> For we come and we ask ourselves the question, what is ibadah? What is to be in a state of worship? What is meant over here, liya abudun? Present continuous tense, like the way the ulama of grammar will say, fi'il mudari liya abudun, liya abudun, meaning that when a present continuous tense verb is used within the Quran, yani a constant state. So long as you are alive and so long as you are breathing, you are within this da'ira of worship of Allah. Meaning that every breath of yours, you are in a form of obedience. Every act that you perform, you ensure that you are not disobeying Allah Azza wa Jal. For making life choices that are within this realm of obedience towards Allah Azza wa Jal. And if you break this down even further, it means aiming for a life where every action of yours is either governed by the rules of those that are the wajibat or the mustahabbat. And that which is mubah also becomes mustahab. And on the other hand, to refrain from those acts 100% that are from the haramat. And as a person ascends in his ranks, he begins to refrain from even that which is makruh. <coughs> until his entire existence dissolves as per the will and the accord of the creator of the universe. 
If this is the purpose of our existence, how do we achieve this? There are multiple steps, which is why you find within the hadith, Amir al Mu'minin, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi, states, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad, awwalu al-deen ma'rifatuh. The first step of religion, anyone seeking religiosity, anyone seeking Islam, anyone seeking to fulfill the purpose of his existence, which is to be an abid, which is why you say in your tashahud, ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh. The word abd in the verse li abudun, and your purpose of existence. For the first step in religiosity is ma'rifah of Allah Azza wa Jal, seeking knowledge. And the role and the importance of seeking knowledge, particularly in the aspect of usul al-deen, tawheed, adala, nabuwa, imama, and ma'ad. You and I, are we able to prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we ourselves convinced before we look at convincing others? You and I have never seen the Rasulullah. Yet how convinced are you and where is your proof that there was actually a figure such as Rasulullah who existed? And from here you embark upon this journey of seeking ilm. But recognizing your God and the traits of your God. Ma'rifa of Allah, understanding who your Lord is, what are the attributes and the characters of your Lord, number one, and number two, what your Lord wants from you in terms of the teachings of this religion which is revealed. And from here, you come and you understand the importance of Sayyidati Nisa al Alameen. Amir al Mu'mineen says, So we draw this silsila. Allah Azza wa Jal says, The purpose of your creation, the purpose of your existence is to worship Him. And Amir al Mu'mineen says, In order for you to worship Him, you must have ma'rifah of Allah. You must know what your creator wants from you and what your creator does not want. In other words, you need to know what you can do to please your creator and what you should abstain from in order to reap the anger of your Lord. And this is where Sayyidah Zahra comes in because Rasulullah said to Zahra alayhi salam, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْضَبَ لِغَذَبَكِ وَيَرْضَى لِرِضَاكِ Allah is pleased with the pleasure of Fatima and Allah is angered with the anger of Fatima. Fatima alayhi salam is the manifestation of the pleasure of your Lord. Fatima is the manifestation of the anger of your Lord. If you want the ma'rifah of Allah, the beginning point is Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Allah. Now you begin to understand suddenly Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra becomes that focal point and the axis which you must go through in order to fulfill the purpose of your existence. And it is from here we begin to understand the ahamiyya, the importance of majalis such as these. The revival of the dhikr of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam is connected to the purpose of our existence. Through the Quran, the words of Amir al Mu'minin, and the hadith of Rasulullah. And therefore, Ya Ahibai, the litmus test of this Ummah is Zahra alayhi salam. Our goal 
is to seek her pleasure and to refrain from her anger because it is the manifestation of the anger and the pleasure of the Lord. <clears throat> and if you understand this, you are able to understand when you dissect Islamic history, which path is the path of Allah and which path is the path of shaitan? Which is the path of purity? And which is the path of impurity? And it is from here we understand a number of points. Again, Ahibai, we live at a time, we live in a day and age where we are engulfed with shubuhat, with doubts. And with misconceptions in regards to the revival of the tragedy of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. And a lot of these ishkalat that are put forward, a lot of these doubts that are put forward in regards to the authenticity of the crimes and the validity of the crimes, the extent of the crimes that happened on Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra can be understood and validated only if we understood her adhama. See, many times historians tend to negate the existence of an event solely because they failed to understand why that event happened. And I throw for you by way of example. And this is a misconception that is very common within our communities. Whereby a person comes forward and he says to you, Baba, does it make sense that Amirul Mu'mineen would send Sayyida Fatima al-Zahra to go and open the door and to be encountered by this so-called Ashab who wanted to attack her? Does it make sense? And if you are in your house with your respected family and you have your wife and you know that there are people who are violent in nature at your doorstep, and as a man, would you send your wife? And so you, you yourself, you wouldn't send your wife. How could Amirul Mu'minin send his wife? Ishkal. This is a question that is put out there. And from here, you open the doors to actually negating the event because what happens is that the mind doesn't comprehend why certain individuals took certain stances. Why did say that Nisa al Alamin go behind the door? And it is important for us to be able to discuss these concepts and to understand the answers, not only for us to have conviction, but in order for us to pass this conviction on to others. For us to have that eloquency when it comes to speaking about our religion and defending the fundamental tenets of our religion and the divine personalities of our religion. The first answer, passing real quick because we have a masaib which is pretty lengthy to recite as well. The first answer to such an ishkal is that who said say that the Nisa al Alamin was going to open the door? Because the question that is put forward in order to negate this entire event is that why would Amirul Mu'mineen send Sayyida Fatima al Zahra to go and open the door? Allahu Akbar. When you read through the entire historical narrations, whether they are authored by our scholars or from the scholars of the Mukhalifin, from the Amma or the Khassa, you will not find a single text that says that Sayyidah Zahra went to open the door. Who said she went to open the door? If she really went to open the door, do you think they would break down the door on her? No, she didn't go to open the door. This is one. Where did this thought come from? Who made up this story? She didn't go to open the door. This is number one. Number two, then the question is that why did Amirul Mu'mineen send Sayyida Zahra to go and open the door? Knowing that these people are violent in nature. And know that this is not a new question. 
This is not a new ishkal. It is not a new question that has been brought up in this day and age. Some baffling discovery to try and invalidate the tragedy of Zahra. La. It was from that very day of Zakifa. The people who came to attack the house of Amirul Mu'mineen themselves were surprised that Fatima alayhi salam were behind the door. And the traditions go on to mention that Ibn Sahak. The first time he shouted out, Oh Ali, come out of the house and give bay'ah and enter into that pledge of allegiance which the entire ummah has accepted. Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen stood behind the door and she said to him, What is it that you want from us? At that point, the Taghut of the Ummah says to Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra, and why is it that Ali has sent you to the door while he sits in the house? For this Ishkal is not Ishkal something new. The attacker of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra himself was baffled. So the question is that why did Sayyidah Zahra go forward? Why did she stand behind the door as a rebuttal? Over here, there are a number of answers. We shall take two, inshallah, that are convincing and sufficient. The first one coming back to the hadith where Rasulullah said to Fatima alayhi salam, Inna Allah la yaghdhab li ghadabik wa yaradha li ridaq. Meaning that Fatima in this ummah, La, rather in this creation, in this universe is the manifestation of the pleasure of Allah and the anger of Allah. Tayyib, if you understand this, there is a dispute in the ummah upon the martyrdom of Rasulullah. Who is the rightful Khalifa after Rasulullah? Is it the people of Sakifa or is it Amirul Mu'mineen? The Muslim Ummah is confused. Give them the benefit of the doubt that they forgot about Eidul Ghadir and Bayatul Ghadir. Forget about all the traditions of Rasulullah that are mentioned in regards to Amirul Mu'mineen. Inta minni bi manzilati Haruna min Musa. Benefit of the doubt the Ashab forgot. Rasulullah has passed away on the assumption, on the assumption that there is a genuine confusion where the Muslim Ummah doesn't know who is the Khalif. Is it Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib or is it Fulan? And there is a dispute in the Ummah. Who does the Ummah go to in order to get a solution to the dispute? Yani, how can the Ummah find out is Allah happy with Fulan as a Khalif or with Ali ibn Abi Talib as a Khalif? The answer is you go to Sayyidah Zahra because this hadith, by the way, which is narrated by the Amma and the Khassa, and from the Amma you have Majma'u Zawa'id of Al Haythami and Al Hakim in his book Al Mustadrak, who mentioned that Allah is angered with the anger of Fatima and pleased with the pleasure of Fatima. So, in this point in time, when the Ummah wants to understand who is the Khalif with whom Allah Allah is pleased we have to go to Fatima and every free soul must ask himself on that day of Sakifa who did Fatima take as the Imam and this is what she said to him when he asked her why have you come behind the door she said, your evil oppression forces me to take this stance and that I may be the ultimate divine proof over you. So we understand from here, Sayyidah Zahra alayhi salam walked to the door and stood behind the door to be, if you can use these words, to be that 
ultimate divine referee and judge between the Imam of Haq and the Imam of Batil. And for this she paid a very dear price. The walking of Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra towards the door represents the jihad. The first one to defend the wilaya of Amirul Mu'mineen was Fatima alayhi salam. And the price that she paid in order to defend the wilaya of Amirul Mu'mineen was her unborn Muhsin. Loved as much, much as she loved Muhsin. Muhsin was named by Rasulullah even before he was born. And within this, there is the Sunnah. We have an entire series of lectures and ahkam that can be derived just from the etiquettes of how to deal with the fetus. Our respected mothers who are expecting or in this stage of family planning, the ethics of how to deal with the fetus. Allahu Akbar. Rasulullah named him Muhsin. And you know that Rasulullah does not speak out of his own will. وَمَا يَنْتِكُ عَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Meaning Allah named this fetus Muhsin. The first martyr. The first shaheed in the path of the wilaya of Amirul Mu'mineen. Understand the value of this love that you carry in your hearts. Understand the value of this Imam who we claim and we attest towards his divinity. Understand the sacrifices that were given for this Imam to prevail. And from here begins these events of sorrow and tragedy that have left a deep wound not only in the hearts of Ahlul Bayt but in the hearts of the Shia until the day of judgment. A wound that perhaps can never be healed unless through divine intercession, because even on the day of judgment, the Shia in their shrouds will cry for that broken rib of Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra. I want to recount for you, to end this majlis, in very brief, in a chronological form, the attack that happened on Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen's house. And for you, brothers and sisters, I want to take you to the city of Medina al Munawwara. And even though our bodies are here in Alperton, our hearts and our minds are in the city of Medina. And it is as if you are sitting between the house of Sayyid al-Zahra and the Masjid al-Nabawi and you are watching these events transpire in front of you, Allahu Akbar. The narrations mention that upon the bay'ah of Saqifa, Kunfud was sent by the jibt of this ummah to go and seek the allegiance from Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. Kunfud went three times to the house of Amirul Mu'mineen to seek the allegiance, but three times Amirul Mu'mineen turned him back and refused to pledge the allegiance. On the fourth time, Sayyidat Nisa al Alameen came behind the door and she said to Kunfud, I bear witness that you are causing me anguish and anger. And none of us shall give you the allegiance so long as Ali is in the house. Kunfud returned back to Masjid al Nabawi, where the people of Saqifa were seated, and he reported back to the Jibt and the Taghut the words of Fatima al Zahra. 
At this point, the second one stood up and said, What do we have to do with the words of the women? For indeed they are emotional and they have no weight. Allahu Akbar. Look at the attacks and the insults on Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra. The words of the women have no impact. At this point, it is narrated Ibn Abi Kahafa stood up and he said to the people in the mosque, Bring Ali from his house and for Force him to give the bay'ah. Atini bihim bi'anafil unf wa in abaw faktulhu. Bring him out in the most violent of ways, and if he refuses to come, then kill him. The narrations mention that the army got together. Allah and army. The narrators mention that 300 people came out of Masjidun Nabawi from the Muhajirin and the Tulaqa. From amongst them was Khalid bin. Walid and Mughira ibn Shu'abah led by Ibn Sahak and Kunfud, 300 of them with torches and with spears. Sayyid ibn Ka'az says, as they marched towards the house of Amir al Mu'minin, I heard the hooves of the horses, and it is as if the land of Medina was shaking with the number of with the number of spears that were being hit on the ground. They surrounded the house of Fatima. Ibn Saha called out, Yabn Abi Talib, come out and give the bay'ah and agree upon what the rest of the Ummah has accepted. At this point, Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra came out and she said to him, what is it that you want? What is it that you want from us. He said to her, O oh Fatima, why does Ali send you to the door while he is seated in the house? She replied back to him and said, It is your oppression and for me to bear and to be a divine judge over you. At this point, Ibn Saha cried out, Tell Ali to come out and give the bay'ah else I shall burn the house on you. Fatima said to him, will you truly burn the house while myself and my children, Hassan and Hussein, are inside? He replied back by saying, Wa in, even if. Sayyidah Fatima al-Zahra cried out. She cried out behind the door and she said, Ya Rasul Allah, Ya Abata, look at how this Ummah is treating us after your martyrdom. At this point he cried out and he said to Fatima, stop the foolish talks. <laughs> He said, stop the foolish talks of the women, for indeed your father is not alive and the angels shall not descend anymore. Fatima began to cry out and invoke upon him through the words and by calling out to the Holy Prophet. At this point, Ibn Sahak saw that nothing shall transpire except them by them burning the house. He called upon Khalid bin Walid and the rest of them. They handed him the torch. They lit the door of Fatima on fire. Allah, Allah, ya Shi'at Ali Muhammad. This is the door of Fatima. This is the door of Allah Azza wa Jal. Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra herself says, as the door began to catch the flames, as the door began to burn and the black smoke began to creep in the house. Sayyidah Fatima al Zahra says, I began to choke. I began to choke with the heaviness of the smoke. Allah, Allah, ya Shia. The narrations mention it. This time, Zahra standing behind the door. Ibn Saha kicked open the burning door. Behind the door was Fatima. She got crushed between the door and the wall. Wa Muhammad. Fatima cried out, Allah. Ibn Sahak says, when I heard the voice of Fatima, 
When I heard the voice of Fatima, I was about to turn back. But then I remembered Ali ibn Abi Talib and the way he had killed the Sanadid in Arab. And I was filled with hatred in my heart. He says, so I kicked the door for a second time with all my strength. Fatima crushed between the door and the wall. Allah, between this broken door, this burning door, Ya Shi'at Fatima, there was a protruding nail. The narrations tell us this nail punctured the lung of Fatima. She fell down to the ground. This time he enters into the house. The narrations mentions, Falatamaha ala khaddeha. He slapped her on both her cheeks. Imam al-Sadiq says, the May Umar slapped Fatima. Her earring broke from her ear. Allah, he didn't stop over there. The narration mentions, Farafasaha birijli. He kicked her with all her strength in the stomach. Wa mahsina. Allah wa muhsina. Sayyidina Zahra. This is the last point of the majlis I want to say to you. Before she cried out, Ya Fidda Sanidini. The narrations mention she sat down on the ground, a broken rib. Mohsin Shaheed with tears flowing down her eyes she turned across the room I don't know if this will capture you but wallah it breaks the heart she says she turned her face across the room with tears rolling down her eyes her eyes met the eyes of Amirul Mu'minin 